so today we're going to talk about gene expression. Gene expression is the process of making proteins from information stored in a gene. Okay, so remember the gene is in the DNA, so the gene is a sequence of bases, um, so A's and T's and C's and G's in a particular order, and that is used uh, to make the primary structure of the protein or the sequence of amino acids. In general, one gene makes one protein. Some cases are more complex than that, but um, for an introductory class on gene expression, uh, thinking about one gene making one protein is just fine. Um, and then the flow of genetic information is not just from the DNA right to making the protein. There's an intermediary between that. So we start at the DNA, that information carried by the um, base sequence and we make something called mRNA and then the protein is made from the mRNA. Okay, so uh, this is just an overview. We're gonna be going through all of these in detail, um, but this is an overview of gene expression using this great analogy of a cookbook and making something from a cookbook. Okay, so let's walk through this. First of all, let me orient you to this slide, okay? So this is in a eukaryotic cell um, here's the nucleus, there's the nuclear core, and this is the cytoplasm, okay? Uh, this is one chromosome, so DNA, with genes in it. Uh, the colored bits are supposed to be the genes, um, and the white bits are supposed to be the intergenic regions. Okay, so, and then here is one gene that's being expressed. Um, it's being made into mRNA by this thing called RNA polymerase. We're going to talk more about that. And then the mRNA is taken out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it finds a ribosome um, and the ribosome actually makes the protein. Remember when we talked about ribosomes way at the beginning of class we said that ribosomes were protein making machines. Well what they do is they read the mRNA to make the protein. Okay so a great analogy for thinking about this um, is the idea of using a cookbook to make a recipe. Okay. So Imagine that you had a cookbook that was really old or a recipe that was really old that you wanted to make sure you kept it because it was your only copy of it. And if something happened to it, um, then you wouldn't have that recipe anymore. You would probably not want to take that recipe into the kitchen with you um, and make whatever it is that you make from it because it might be damaged, right? You might spill something on it um, and make it so you can't read it, okay? So um, you would then copy that recipe, say a cookie recipe, onto an index card or a piece of paper that you can then take with you into the kitchen, right, and you take that copy of the recipe into the kitchen and then use it to combine all of the ingredients to make the final product, which would be the cookies in this case. Okay, so this analogy works if you think about the, um, the old recipe, say your grandmother's recipe, um, as the DNA, right, it's the original copy of the information needed to make something and you don't want something to happen to it. It's the same thing with the DNA. Um, the DNA needs to stay protected, so it stays in the nucleus um, where it can be protected, and uh, that way it, it doesn't lose it, right? Because that's the single copy of the information that the gene has, okay? Uh, the mRNA is like the index card, okay? It's a copy of the information that is in the grandmother's cookbook, and then that can be taken into the kitchen um, where it hooks up with a chef, um, which is like a ribosome. You can think of the ribosome as a tiny chef um, making the recipe. And the amino acids would be all of the ingredients used to make that. Okay, okay. so now we're going to talk about this more in a scientific way. Um, before we talk about that, we just need to note one thing, um, and that is that, uh, you know, DNA is double-stranded, so it has um, two strands, right? We already talked a lot about that. Um, and both sides have a sequence of bases, and of course they're complementary to each other. But they can also both carry genes. So uh, it says there are ge uh, genes on both sides of the double-stranded molecule. That means depending on which way you read it, there could be a gene here. Like this would be a really small gene, right? So that could be one gene. And remember, one gene makes one protein. And then on the other side, even in that same place, you could have another gene. Okay? So you could have another gene um, even overlapping all of it. Oh, that wasn't a very good color pick. You can't see it, but that's okay. 
then this would be a second gene. Okay, and that would make a different protein. So DNA is really long and contains many genes, uh, but it can contain even more genes than you might have originally thought because it can be read both ways. All right, so since there is this thing going on of being able to have genes on both sides, you need to specify which side you are reading, okay? Um, the side that has the gene of interest, meaning the gene that's going to be expressed, the protein that's going to be made, we call that the template strand, okay? So if we wanted to make this gene, uh, make this protein here and express this gene, then this side would be the template strand and the other side would be the non-template strand. Okay. You could reverse that if instead we wanted to uh, be expressing this gene, then this gene, or then this side of the DNA would be called the template strand and this would be called the non-template strand. So those terms are relative and just help us orient um, on the DNA, which side is being read only one side can be read at a time. And when I say read, I mean made into a protein. We'll go through gene expression. All right, so gene expression is a two-step process. The first uh, step is taking the DNA and copying it into mRNA. And we call this transcription. Okay, so in transcription, the information in the DNA is copied into the mRNA. Um, this happens in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. And why? Well, because that's where the DNA is and that's where the DNA stays. Okay? Um, in prokaryotic cells, there's no nucleus and the DNA is just in the cytoplasm, so that's where transcription works. Okay? Transcription is a great name for this because it's descriptive. Okay? When you transcribe something, you're just copying it. Okay? So say you wrote down exactly everything that was on this slide in English, but in your handwriting, you would be transcribing it, right? The information is the same, but the handwriting is different than the typing, right? Or if you copied something that I had written, handwritten in your handwriting, that would be transcribing it. And that's the same thing, uh, or it's similar to what happens with DNA being read and made into mRNA because they are both nucleotides. Uh, made of nucleotides. They're both nucleic acids. So in DNA, the information is stored in that sequence of bases. And remember, there's A's, G's, C's, and T's in particular order. For mRNA, information is also stored in the sequence of bases. And we're going to talk about mRNA more in just a second here. Uh, but the bases for that are instead of all the same, except for uh, instead of T, we have a U. But the information is still stored in the sequence of bases. Okay. So when we go from the information in DNA to the inf information in mRNA, we don't change languages. We still stay in the language of nucleotides, um, but it's just like a different handwriting. Okay, and then the second step in the process is called translation. Okay, translation is when the information uh, that's stored in the mRNA in that sequence of bases is used to make a protein, okay? And this occurs on ribosomes um, in the cytoplasm. Uh, they can be free ribosomes that are floating around in the cytoplasm or attached to the rough ER. And remember for the rough ER proteins, those will be um, proteins that are going to be excreted from the cell or become part of the membrane. Okay, and uh, translation is a good name for this because you're actually changing um, languages, right? We're going from mRNA, which is nucleotides, um, or a nucleic acid to a protein, which is a sequence of amino acids. Okay, so here in the protein, the information is stored in the order of the amino acids. Okay, and then just a reminder too, so the order of the amino acids is the primary structure that gives rise to the tertiary structure or the overall shape of the protein, and that gives it, it, give it, gives it its function, excuse me. Okay, all right, so now we're gonna go through transcription and then we're going to go through translation and at the end I have a video that pulls everything together um, so these processes can be a little overwhelming um, and hopefully going through this and then going through the video and then you know um, working through it in class and that kind of stuff will help you understand it alrighty so transcription is the first and that's when we go from DNA to mRNA okay so here's our DNA um, here's our template strand, and here is the mRNA that's going to be made from that. 
Okay, but before we talk about this, let's, you know, talk about what mRNA is. Okay. mRNA is just a type of RNA. Um, M stands for messenger RNA, and its particular job is to carry the genetic message from the DNA to the ribosome. So it's, it's an intermediary, um, and it's a copy of the genetic information. RNA is a nucleic acid. It's very similar to DNA. Um, so a lot of the stuff you, stuff you already learned about DNA also applies to mRNA, but it's slightly different. So I compiled this chart, this um, comparison chart, to go through the similarities and differences. Okay, so what is it? Well, DNA and RNA are both nucleic acids, and that means they're polymers of nucleotides. Okay. The nucleotides are slightly different, though. They both have a phosphate group uh, and a 5-carbon sugar, but the sugar that they have is slight, slightly different. Right. For DNA, it's deoxyribose, and for RNA, it's ribose. Okay. Additionally, uh, the bases and the base pairing are similar in some aspects, but different in others. So for DNA, we have an A and T are the base pairs, and a G and C. And remember that A and G are purines, and get a different color, uh, T and C are primidines, okay? For RNA, we have A and U and G and C. So we have U instead of T, okay? I wish it was easier to switch ink colors, my goodness. Um, so same thing here, A and G are purines, meaning they have two rings. Um, and remember when we talked about DNA, how uh, we said that a a purine always has to bond with a pyrimidine, right? And the, so that means that the U, which stands for uracil, is also a pyrimidine, okay, as is C, okay? So for whatever reason, instead of T in RNA, we have a U, okay? And this applies to, so we're talking generally about RNA. These things that we're talking about apply to all types of RNA. Um, there's mRNA, there's tRNA and there's rRNA, um, and we'll talk about those as we go. Uh, so these also apply to mRNA. Okay, their function is different, right? So DNA stores genetic information, while uh, most types of RNA participate in gene expression in some way or another, or making proteins. And in particular, mRNA carries that message from the DNA to the ribosome. Okay, different enzymes make them. So DNA polymerase is the enzyme that links together uh, DNA nucleotides to make the nucleic acid, DNA nucleic acid, a, a cousin enzyme, RNA polymerase is the enzyme uh, that links together RNA polymers, oh, excuse me, links together RNA nucleotides to make the RNA nucle nucleic acid. Okay, and the other thing is that their structure is slightly different, so they both are nucleic acids, they're polymers of nucleotides. Uh, DNA is always double-stranded, um, with those hydrogen bonds between the bases, whereas mRNA is always single-stranded. So it is just, you know, one long strand of, MR, of, the, uh, M, of the RNA nucleotides. All right, let's go through the steps of transcription. All right, so the first thing, the first step, of which there are three steps in uh, transcription. And remember, transcription is when we're going from DNA to mRNA. DNA to mRNA, that's transcription. Okay, so the first thing that has to happen is that RNA polymerase, remember that's the enzyme I just talked about that makes mRNA. So RNA polymerase binds to something called the promoter sequence. Okay? The promoter is a signal to RNA polymerase, which I always abbreviate RNA pole, okay? So that's the same as RNA polymerase. Um, so it's a signal to RNA polymerase that says, gene starts here. Okay, it's always found just before the gene, okay? Um, so looking at this double-stranded DNA molecule, uh, the promoter is gonna be right here, okay? 
um, and that means that the gene is going to be on this darker blue side of it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to do that when it is twisted but that would be the gene right so that means that this is the template side and then the other side is the non-template side okay the promoter always occurs upstream of the gene meaning it occurs right before the gene starts Okay, and it's just a signal to RNA polymerase to hop on there, okay? And RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, and then it starts to separate the double helix, okay? Remember, the double helix are bound together by hydrogen bonds, and what RNA polymerase wants to do is to get in and read the sequence of these bases that are on the template strand, and in order to do that, it needs to pull apart the double helix. A lot of times, you, um, people refer to this as unzipping, so it unzips the DNA and it only does that right where it's working okay so that's initiation that's the first step the second step of transcription is called elongation elongation lasts the whole time that the mRNA is being made okay so in elongation RNA polymerase which is here just moves this is the promoter here so this is showing it part way through um, elongation um, RNA polymerase is just going to move down the template strand and it, as it does that it continues to unwind the DNA and to make RNA and this could be either mRNA or tRNA or what have you um, it can it makes the mRNA by catalyzing the addition of RNA nucleotides into the RNA molecule okay. using base pair rules okay um, so basically what it it reads something, some base in the RNA, in the DNA strand, and it builds that RNA based on what it reads using base pair rules, okay? Uh, but remember, we're dealing with RNA here, okay? and this is where sometimes it gets a little bit confusing. So let's go through this, okay? So imagine this is your section of gene, okay? This does not show the promoter on it. We have a five prime end with a sequence of bases and a three prime end, and then the opposite side is going to be the three prime to five prime end okay we're going to say that this is our template strand okay so that means that's the strand that rna polymerase would read um, to make the rna okay and what it's going to do is as it goes through and reads the different bases it's going to add the mrna bases okay um, so this strand so this is the mrna and this right here is the template. Which remembers I'll write it up here. Template strand. Okay. And that means this guy right here is the non template. Boy, my handwriting is so bad with this little thing. Sorry guys. I don't have that bad of handwriting in real life. Um, okay, so this is the non template strand. This is the template strand. Okay, and RNA polymerase will go through and read the template strand and build the mRNA using RNA base pair rules, okay? So remember for RNA, A and U go together and G and C, which seems pretty straightforward, but the problem that gets a little tricky is that when it reads a T, it just gonna, is going to add an A because that goes back to the DNA, right? Okay, so what happens um, is if it reads a T, it's going to add an A, the mRNA. If it reads a G, it'll add a C. If it reads a C, it'll add a G. And then if it reads an A, it's going to add a U. Okay, and then if it reads a T, it's going to add an A. T, A, G, C, C, G, A, U, G, C, T, A. Okay, and so on. Um, pretty straightforward. You're just using base pair rules. The only thing you have to remember is that you, if you read an A in a template strand, then you are going to add a U instead of a T, okay? So RNA, you'll know, you guys are going to be practicing making mRNA in class, um, and you'll know that uh, one tip off for that you made your mRNA correctly uh, is that you have U's instead of T's. So there are no T's in mRNA. Okay, so that's one thing people do, we'll write a T instead. The other thing that people start getting confused about is that they read an, a T and then they put in a U. 
And that's not right, right? Because T and U are not base pairs. T and A are base pairs. Um, let's see, one more thing to notice, and that is that, let's, I'm just gonna erase some of this stuff too, because it's so cluttered. Okay, the other thing to notice here is that um, the non-template strand, which is this one, and the temp and the mRNA, which is this, ah, which is let's do a better job. This one here are the same, more or less. They are the same in everything except for when there's a T in the temp non-template strand. There's a U in the mRNA. Okay, um, and the reason why they are the same is because they are both complementary to this template strand, right? The DNA, the you know, other side of the DNA is complementary to the template strand, as is the mRNA. Okay? Um, so when you're making mRNA uh, and you have both of these, or you have just the non-template strand, you can simply recopy the template strand as mRNA, and you just have to remember every time you read a T in your mRNA, you put a U. Okay? This is a good shortcut um, that prevents errors for us. Um, and so I'm telling you about it now. We're going to practice it in class as well. All right, moving on. Um, so the RNA polymerase is just going to move back up here for a second. Uh, move all the way down the gene, doing that same thing, elongating the mRNA, reading the nucleotides um, of the DNA, and putting in the mRNA nucleotides until it gets to something called the termination signal. Okay. And this is the signal to the DNA, uh, to the RNA polymerase to stop. So it tells MR, excuse me, tells, tells RNA polymerase, this is the end of the gene. Okay, so it's just a signal. Um, it's not part of the gene. Remember I said that some of the non-coding regions of DNA are on off switches or their regulatory sequences well the promoter and the terminator signal are part of those right so they say where where the gene starts and where it ends and tells rna polymerase where to start and where to end okay? when rna polymerase gets to the termination signal rna polymerase um, it drops off of the dna um, and releases it the dna automatically closes back up and then it, rna polymerase polymerase also releases the um, RNA that was just made, the mRNA that was just made. That mRNA is then going to go out into the, um, out into the cytoplasm where it's going to hook up with a ribosome and be read and made into a protein. Okay, so this just shows all of those uh, three slides put together, right? Do initiation, RNA polymerase binds at the promoter, unzips the DNA, then in elongation, this is the longest phase of transcription. Um, RNA polymerase is just moving down the template strand, building that mRNA molecule, and then it gets to the termination signal, um, and so that's termination. RNA polymerase drops everything, uh, falls off the DNA, releases the mRNA. The mRNA is going to go out to the cytoplasm. Where it will find a for find a ribosome, and the um, RNA polymerase and the DNA can then go through that whole process again. So remember, RNA polymerase is just an enzyme, and that means its whole job is to read genes and make mRNA. So once it's done doing one, it just goes and finds another promoter to bind to, and goes again. Alrighty, next is translation. So this is the second step of um, protein synthesis or gene expression, and this is when we go from the mRNA to the protein. Okay, so that's the step here, right? We just made our mRNA during transcription, and now we're going to go to translation, where we're going to take that mRNA and use it to make amino acids. Um, use, excuse me, use it to make a protein that is uh, amino acids linked together. And remember, the amino acids are linked by peptide bonds. That's the primary structure. All right, let's talk about how this works. So unfortunately, both trans, trans, oh, I didn't change that. Ah, 
Ah, this should be translation. I think all of my slides are wrong. I'll fix it as I go. I was doing this really late at night last night. <laughs> so I guess I forgot to change it. Um, okay, so what I was saying was, unfortunately, all of the uh, steps of transcription and translation, the three steps are exactly the same name. Not The same thing doesn't happen during them, but they have the same name. So transcription has initiation, elongation, and termination. And translation has initiation, elongation, and termination, okay? And this just makes it harder, right? Transcription and translation are words that sound like each other, and then they have the same three steps in them. Uh, so I probably have to spend some extra time thinking about that. All right, so translation going from mRNA to protein. Um, the first thing that happens is the ribosome. Um, the ribosome actually has two subunits. It has a large subunit and a small subunit. Um, the, so what happens is basically the small subunit and the large subunit and the mRNA and something called tRNA all bind together at something called the start codon. Okay, so that introduces some things that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, tRNAs and a codon. Met, this is the amino acid methionine. Okay, so Met is code for that. Okay, so let's break this up a little bit. So first of all, what are tRNAs? So tRNA stands for, uh, officially for transfer RNA, but I also like to think of it as the taxi RNA. And that's because its whole job um, is to go out into the cytoplasm, grab the correct amino acid, and bring it to the ribosome. Okay, so its job is to bring in the correct amino acid into the ribosome. And how it does that um, is through complementary base pairing. Okay, so this, these three bases right here are called the anticodon in the tRNA. Okay, they are complementary to something called the codon in the mRNA. Okay, so the codons are sets of three bases that specify amino acids. Okay, so the anticodon is three base sequence complementary to the three base sequence, which is called the codon on the mRNA. Okay, so we're going to talk about this as we go, but each codon specifies an amino acid. Um, and then the mRNA codons match with a tRNA that carries one particular amino acid. So every codon has a particular amino acid. Right? So every codon is in the mRNA, has a particular anticodon that goes with it in, on a tRNA that carries a particular amino acid. Right? So that's what the tRNA does. Um, it's important to understand what the tRNA do, but as we go through and start um, translating our own strands of mRNA, um, we'll just use something called a codon table, uh, which kind of skips over the tRNA. Uh, but it is important to understand what the ribosome is doing and how it's doing it, and it needs the tRNA. All right, so, um, so here we go again, right? So we have our small subunit and our large subunit. They're going to bind to the mRNA at something called the start codon. So the start codon is a special codon. It's always the three uh, RNA bases A, U, G, okay? And it always codes for something called methionine. The start codon um, does two things. It says to the ribosome, this is where the start of the gene is, and it also um, codes for methionine. So the ribosome knows to bind there because it's the start of the gene, and also knows to put in the, MR, the uh, amino acid methionine. Okay? Note that the start codon, um, so this would be the A, U, G, is not at the start of the mRNA. Okay, the mRNA usually has a cap on it and a tail, and this is some extra bases that are protecting the actual gene. Okay? So mRNAs get used actually over and over and over again until they fall apart, the, um, so, so they can get degraded. Amino acid, um, nucleotides can get pushed off the end of them or start to be digested or fall apart, and the, those cap, the cap and tail just protect it. Okay? So you'll find that both the signal to start and the signal to end 
are within a larger sequence of, um, of nucleotides. All right, once that has happened and the ribosome has bound to the mRNA and brought in the start codon, elongation happens. Okay, I do have a video that shows this. It's a very dynamic process. It's a little bit hard to understand when you're looking at something two-dimensional and static um, and trying to explain it. So I know you've read about it in your book and I'm gonna talk you through it now um, and then I'll show the video at the end and hopefully it'll all come together. It usually takes a couple passes at it to get it. Okay. Uh, so this is shown kind of midway uh, through reading a gene. Okay. So the gene is actually here between the start codon and something called the stop codon. Okay. And this is partway through it. Okay. The, notice that they've divided up the mRNA into things, into codons, right? So here's one codon, here's another codon, here's another codon. And each codon is a specific sequence of three RNA bases that specifies a particular amino acid or is a signal in the case of the stop codons. Okay, um, and then the other thing to notice is that, I can't remember if your book, I think your book uses the three sites, or it might just say there's two, there's different books do different things. Uh, there's several places in the ribosome for uh, the tRNAs to be, right? And so this is showing three. The first one is where the tRNA comes in, and then it moves into the middle site, and that is where um, the amino acid, the bond between the amino acids is created, and then that amino acid is pulled off of the tRNA, and the tRNA leaves and can go get another amino acid. Okay, let's go through this. Okay, so first of all, after we've started um, at the start codon, now the whole ribosome unit starts moving down the along, along the mRNA, down the gene, okay, um, reading in sets of three, okay. Uh, as it moves along, new codons will move into this active site, okay, and that means that the corresponding tRNAs will come in and bring the correct amino acid, okay. So for this one, this codon specifies um, isoleucine, and so that's the amino acid that has been brought in. Okay, then the ri ribosome is going to catalyze the peptide bond between the previous amino acid and the amino acid that just got brought in, okay, and that then transfers this whole growing protein onto this um, tRNA, and then the whole thing moves down, and then this one would be in this spot, and then the empty tRNA leaves, and then the ribosome is going to move down the mRNA by one codon and do that whole thing again. Okay, so the ribosome is reading down the mRNA in chunks of three, so codons, and every time it reads one, it's going to add an amino acid, then shoot, goes to the next one, adds another amino acid, shoot, goes to the next one, adds another amino acid, and uh, the tRNA is just bringing in the correct amino acids. Okay, so elongation in, um, oops, this should also say translation. I'm really sorry about that. Like those words aren't confusing enough. Um, so elongation of translation is also the longest time, right? It's because when, that's when the gene is actually being read and the translation is happening. Translation. I'll try to remember to fix that on the one that I post on our website. Um, so the last stage of translation is termination. Okay, and this is when the ribosome encounters something called a stop codon. Okay? The stop codon um, does not specify an amino acid. Instead, um, it makes a something called a release factor that's not shown here, it's just a protein, um, come in to that active site and that causes the ribosome to stop translation. Okay? Um, so there are specific codons that are stop codons and I'll show you those. And the, anyways, it just causes translation to end so the stop codon is a signal to the ribosome. Hey, we're done with the gene. The um, protein is released. Um, the mRNA is released from the ribosome and the ribosome then can go off and do the whole process again. All right, so here's the codon table. All right. So um, somebody was clever and um, basically figured out what amino acids go with which codons. Okay, so this is a way for humans 
um, you know, to have a sequence of DNA bases um, and then to be able to predict what the sequence of mRNA bases are and then be able to read that and say what the sequence of amino acids in the protein is. Ribosomes don't read this, right? Ribosomes are just machines. They rely on tRNAs to read um, the codon and bring in the correct amino acid. Okay. So there's a couple of things I want you, I'm going to show you how to use this, okay? But first of all, just notice um, all of these are the names of the amino acids with their three letter codes, okay? Um, and then these are the codons that specify for that amino acid. So first of all, here is the start codon. Okay. Every protein has to start with a start codon, and so that means that every protein starts with methionine. Sometimes it's taken off after the protein is being made, but as the protein is being made, it always has to start with met or methionine. Okay. So remember the start codon says start if you find it at the beginning of the protein. Sometimes it's also found in the, in the middle of the mRNA or someplace else, and then that, that just adds a methionine to the growing strand of amino acids. Um, and then the other thing are these stop codons. Okay. So remember the stop codons don't code for amino acids. They are instead signals to the ribosome that this is the end of the uh, gene and you need to stop making the protein. All the other... Um, codons code for actual amino acids. So there are actually, remember there are 20 amino acids. I'm going to say AA for amino acids. There are actually 64 possible codons. Um, so in other words, 64 ways to combine A's and C's and G's and U's, I get all those, um, into sets of three. Okay, And that means that we have some overlap or redundancy in our, um, in our codon table. Okay, so you see that here, right? UUU and UUC both code for the same amino acid. So two codons specify one amino acid. And then many others have even more. Proline has four different uh, codons that code for proline. Uh, leucine has actually six, right? Um, so this is re makes the um, codon table a little redundant. And actually this is really handy um, when it comes, if a mutation happens, um, so we'll be talking about mutations soon, but one thing to notice is that what is different between, well, I didn't circle that very good, did I? So what is different between these different codons is just the last base, right? And you see that over and over again. And that means there's a little wiggle room. Like if the DNA has a mutation um, and the last um, base in a codon is changed, then it can still specify the same amino acid. So that can help prevent some uh, mutations from causing problems. And that will make more sense when we talk about mutations, I think. Okay, so we just talked about the redundancy. The other thing um, is that uh, the codon table is unambiguous. So ambiguous means confusing, but the codon table makes it unambiguous, meaning that every amino acid, um, there, is a, there are specific codons that go with that amino acid, okay? So G -U -G, or C -U -C always codes for leucine. It doesn't sometimes code for leucine and sometimes co code for glycine. No, it always codes for leucine, and that means it's unambiguous. If you read a codon, you will know which amino acid it goes with. Okay. And then the other cool thing is that this is universal for all organisms. We all use the same codon table. So you can take mRNA from a, pro, uh, from a uh, prokaryote, like a bacterium, um, and you can figure out the sequence of amino acids in the, in the genes, uh, in the proteins made from the genes using this codon table, the same one that we would use to figure out human DNA um, or human genes and what the sequence of amino acids is. This allows us to, to do genetic engineering, right, where we can take a sequence of bases or a gene from, say, a bacterium and add it to a eukaryotic cell, say, a plant cell, um, and it's treated the same, okay? So it's, you know, it's 
mRNA is mRNA is mRNA. It doesn't matter who it's from. It's pretty much the same and is read by the ribosome in the, the more or less the same way. All right, let's practice this a little bit, and you guys are going to have a chance in class to practice this as well. Okay, okay so here's our mRNA uh, with its different codons in it. Okay, um, and what you want to do is look for the first AUG you see together. So it's right there. And then that's called setting the reading frame. After that, you read in sets of three bases all the way down the mRNA until you get to a stop codon. Okay, what you don't want to do, oops, what you don't want to do is <laughs> that just really wants to go on there. What you don't want to do is start at the beginning and um, set up your reading frame starting just at the beginning. You have to remember uh, that you need to look for that first AUG. Okay. Okay. So there's the first AUG, and the AUG always codes for methionine, right down here. Um, and so that means you're going to put methionine in as your first amino acid in your protein. And then you're going to go to your second amino acid, uh, second codon. And here you're going to use the codon table to look up the amino acid. You're going to take the first base, U, and use this side of the codon table to look for the row it's in. Okay, so this is the U. Oh, I'm not doing a very good job with that, am I? Hold on. This is the U row, so that means our codon is going to be somewhere in here. Then the next is an A, so we're going to go here, and so now we know it's somewhere here. Um, and then our last one is a U, and so we can use the, the third side to look over and see that it's right here. Or you can just scan through those four and see which it is. In any case, you'll find out that it's tyrosine, T-Y-R, um, and so you'd write that into your codon, or into your amino acid sequence. And the next one is CGA, okay, and that codes for arginine, if you look it up. And then what's this next one? We just got to a UGA. UGA is a stop codon. Okay? So that means that we just stopped writing out the amino acid sequence. That, for this very small thing, we would just have three amino acids. Okay? Don't write stop. Everyone wants to write stop, but stop is not an amino acid. Okay? This is our amino acid sequence. Um, this is our amino acid sequence, and that would be the, the primary sequence of your protein. No proteins are really that short. All right, um, and so that concludes my part of talking about this stuff. And next, I'm going to show you this video that puts everything together um, as far as transcription and translation. For our bodies to function, we need to supply them with a variety of nutrients we get from our diet. Our bodies cannot use the food as it is when it enters our digestive system. The process of chemical digestion uses different proteins and enzymes to break down the food particles into usable nutrients our cells can absorb. And where are the instructions to manufacture these and all the different types of proteins we need to stay alive? The instructions to make proteins are contained in our DNA. DNA contains genes. A gene is a continuous string of nucleotides containing a region that codes for an RNA molecule. This region begins with a promoter and ends in a terminator. Genes also contain regulatory sequences that can be found near the promoter or at a more distant location. For some genes, the encoded RNA is used to synthesize a protein in a process called gene expression. For these genes, expression can be divided into two processes, transcription and translation. In eukaryotic cells, transcription occurs in the nucleus, where DNA is used as a template to make messenger RNA. Then in translation, which occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell, the information contained in the messenger RNA is used to make a polypeptide. During transcription, the DNA in the gene is used as a template to make a messenger RNA strand with the help of the enzyme RNA polymerase. This process occurs in three stages. Initiation, elongation, and termination. 
During initiation, the promoter region of the gene functions as a recognition site for RNA polymerase to bind. This is where the majority of gene expression is controlled, by either permitting or blocking access to this site by the RNA polymerase. Binding causes the DNA double helix to unwind and open. Then during elongation, the RNA polymerase slides along the template DNA strand. As the complementary bases pair up, the RNA polymerase links nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing RNA molecule. Once the RNA polymerase reaches the terminator portion of the gene, the messenger RNA transcript is complete, and the RNA polymerase, the DNA strand, and the messenger RNA transcript dissociate from each other. The strand of messenger RNA that is made during transcription includes regions called exons that code for a protein, and non-coding sections called introns. In order for the messenger RNA to be used in translation, the non-coding introns need to be removed, and modifications such as a 5' prime cap and a 3' prime poly A tail are added. This process is called intron splicing and is performed by a complex made up of proteins and RNA called a spliceosome. This complex removes the intron segments and joins the adjacent exons to produce a mature messenger RNA strand that can leave the nucleus through a nuclear pore and enter the cytoplasm to begin translation. How is the information in the mature messenger RNA strand translated into a protein? The nitrogenous bases are grouped into three letter codes called codons. The genetic code includes 64 codons. Most codons code for specific amino acids. There are four special codons, one that codes for start and three that code for stop. Translation begins with the messenger RNA strand binding to the small ribosomal subunit upstream of the start codon. Each amino acid is brought to the ribosome by a specific transfer RNA molecule. The type of amino acid is determined by the anticodon sequence of the transfer RNA. Complementary base pairing occurs between the codon of the messenger RNA and the anticodon of the transfer RNA. After the initiator transfer RNA molecule binds to the start codon, the large ribosomal subunit binds to form the translation complex and initiation is complete. In the large ribosomal subunit, there are three distinct regions called the E, P, and A sites. During elongation, individual amino acids are brought to the messenger RNA strand by a transfer RNA molecule through complementary base pairing of the codons and anticodons. Each anticodon of a transfer RNA molecule corresponds to a particular amino acid. A charged transfer RNA molecule binds to the A site and a peptide bond forms between its amino acid and the one attached to the transfer RNA molecule at the P site. The complex slides down one codon to the right where the now uncharged transfer RNA molecule exits from the E site and the A site is open to accept the next transfer RNA molecule. Elongation will continue until a stop codon is reached. A release factor binds to the A site at a stop codon, and the polypeptide is released from the transfer RNA in the P site. The entire complex dissociates and can reassemble to begin the process again at initiation. The purpose of translation is to produce polypeptides quickly and accurately. After dissociation, the polypeptide may need to be modified before it is ready to function. Modifications take place in different organelles for different proteins. In order for a digestive enzyme to be secreted into the stomach or intestines, the polypeptide is translated into the endoplasmic reticulum, modified as it passes through the Golgi, 
then secreted using a vesicle through the plasma membrane of the cell into the lumen of the digestive tract. Proteins are needed for most physiological functions of the body to occur properly, such as breaking down food particles in digestion, and the processes of transcription and translation make the production of proteins possible.